Hello and welcome to another Outlaws of Thunder Junction limited set review. I'm Paul Chion, and today we are going to be going over the blue cards. We're going to be valuing every single blue card in Outlaws of Thunder Junction uh, with the context of its applications in limited magic. So limit, uh, draft, sealed, what have you. And uh, before I get started though, I do want to kind of go over my grading scale overall. I have five, I'm going, I'm doing a letter grading scale from A through F, A those are your bombs. You first pick, you slam them, you're happy to first pick them, they're going to be among the best cards in the set. Examples of this from Murders at Karlov Manor are Aurelia's Vindicator, Izoni, and Cryptic Coat. Then the next here are the B cards. Now the B cards are all good cards. If you are those colors, you are never ever going to be cutting them, and you're going to be frequently first picking these cards if a good rare is not in the pack. Examples of cards that are B-level cards are Torch the Witness, Neighborhood Guardian, and A Killer Among Us. Moving on to C-tier, this is going to be kind of the meat and potatoes of your deck. These are the solid cards. You will rarely cut these cards in your deck unless your deck is completely absurd. Examples of C-level cards are Nervous Gardener, Projector Inspector, and Murder. Moving on, we have the D-tier. These are your filler cards. These are cards you don't really want to play in your deck, but often... One or two copies of this card are going to end up into your deck. Cards in the filler tier typically are going to be your 22nd, your 20th to 23rd cards that, that ends up making it into your deck. Examples of cards like this are Suspicious Detonation, Griff Not Tracker, and Shady Informant. And then, of course, you have F tier cards. These are cards I classify as garbage. Don't ever take these cards. Examples are uh, Slime Against Humanity. Magnifying Glass, Behind the Mask, these are just generally cards you don't ever want to put in your deck and you would be very, very disappointed in having those cards end up in your deck. Before I start this review though, I do want to say if you wanted to support this channel in another way, I do have a Patreon channel. Shout out to all the current patrons, really do appreciate your support. The link is in the description below. Additionally, there are lots of mechanics in this set and we took some time to go over it in the previous set, so I'll in the white set review, so I'll try to be a little bit quicker. We have Saddle, which comes on creatures, and basically Saddle is a variation of crew, but you can only do it on your turn. You can tap creatures that you control sideways uh, up to a Saddle X cost. So example, this Archmage's Newt that you see has Saddle 3. So you need to tap other creatures with power 3 or greater combined to be able to saddle this card. And when you saddle something, you get an extra benefit out of doing so. Additionally, you have plot cards. Plot cards are spells that you can pay mana for, pay an upfront mana cost for, and you get to exile them at sorcery speed. And then on a later turn, so not the turn that you plot it, but any other later turn, you can cast it for free, allowing you to kind of set up future turns. Then we have crime. You commit a crime as long as you cast a spell or activate an ability or put a triggered ability on the stack that targets one or more of the following. An opponent a spell or permanent in opponent controls, or a card in an opponent's graveyard. Once you cast a spell, activate the ability. The crime has already been uh, committed, so you can't counter the crime ability from happening. The crime ability has happened once you target your opponent in some way. Finally, you have Spree. This is a new keyword that you find on several modal cards, and it basically allows you to pay additional mana for different modes on a spree card. So it's just another modal card. If you pay extra mana, you can get extra abilities. If a card has, say, three different spree abilities and spree costs, you can pay however much mana you want to get up to all the abilities on said spree cards. All right, but now is the time. Let's head straight into the first card that we see here. We have Arch Archmage's Newt. This is a one and a blue for a 2-2 two -two Salamander Mount. Whenever Archmage's Newt deals combat damage to a player, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. That card gains flashback zero until end of turn instead if Archmage's Newt is saddled. So if you don't saddle this card and you hit your opponent, you get to cast a spell from your graveyard. You have to pay the mana cost of the card, but that's a lot of extra value. If you have cheap removal or any cheap spells, that's great. The problem, of course, is being able to land a hit with this card. But if you saddle it, if you can manage to find a way to saddle this and have this card actually connect, I don't know if there's a way to give this card evasion, but if there's a way for you to saddle this, then you get to play the card for free. So that is a ton of value. 
right? This is also a two mana 2-2, two -two, which you often don't get in blue. So the fact that this is a two mana 2-2 two -two with massive, massive upside, right? We're talking like, let's say you play this card and um, I mean, l l let me just think of like a, a, let's say you're even on the draw, right? Your opponent plays a two drop, you play this on turn two. Your opponent attacks and plays a three drop. If you kill their creature, like if you shock their creature and then you attack with this, then you can play the shock to kill their other creature. I'm just, there's a lot of incredible things that you can do with this. There is a little bit of a setup cost, but we're talking about a bear with amazing upside. So I want to give this card a B just because I feel like if this card ever gets to go off, if you can find a way to connect with this card, let's say you put Thundering Lasso on this card, right? That's the a white uncommon that taps when this creature, when a creature attacks. All of a sudden, you have uh, a uh, you know a card uh, card advantage generating machine in the newt. So really big fan of this creature. Moving on, we have the canyon crab. One in the blue, four in O5. Don't like those stats, but one in the blue canyon crab gets plus two minus two until end of turn. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, draw a card, then discard a card. So there's a very specific deck that this deck, that this card wants to go into. Obviously, it's not some kind of tempo-ish aggressive deck. It's one of those decks that's looking to go Drago. So the blue-white color combination is a color combination where there are cards that pay you off for not casting a spell on your turn. You get a bonus effect. So Canyon Crab is excellent at that because it's an amazing blocker. You play it. And then later, it's a mana sink. Sure, right? You can keep mana up. And if you keep mana up and your opponent attacks you, you have the ability to pay the mana to trade however profitably you want. And then... If you do, don't do something, you also get to loot. So I think this is a nice role player, but it goes in a very specific deck because its combat stats are pretty bad. But I would say that, you know, Canyon Crab probably is a C, especially in the, perhaps even a C plus in the decks that are looking to play uh, that Drago style of deck with the Canyon Crab. Next, we have Daring Thunder Thief. Three and a blue for a Turtle Rogue. Flash. Daring Thunder Thief enters the battlefield tap. So it's a little bit weird because it has flash, but it has it's a flash creature, but you can't ambush anything. But it enters the battlefield tap, and it's a 4-4. Four, four. So honestly, I mean, for blue to get a 4-mana four 4-4, four, four, even with a drawback, is pretty great. And the drawback is the turn that you played, you can't cast it. However, this card goes very well with a lot of the other things that blue and white's trying to do, which is, of course, pass and get bonus abilities from other creatures. And this is a card that lets you pass and play a creature at instant speed any creature with flash i think the value does go up because it works so well with those payoff cards that tell you to pass for the turn for example the crab you play the crab you pass you loot and then you still get to play uh, daring thunder thief now of course if you're a little bit behind on board your opponent can attack you and you get to play a four drop that doesn't actually impact the board the turn that you cast it. So that is a drawback here. But I think this is a pretty solid creature that goes well in those strategies. I'm going to give Daring Thunder Thief a C. Moving on, we have Deep Muck Desperado. That's two and a blue for a 2-4. Creature type, Homerid Mercenary. When you commit a crime, each opponent mills three cards. Disability triggers only once each turn. So this is a really, really interesting card. It's a greatly statted defensive creature. Three mana, two, four is just a really solid blocker. And depending on how easy it is to commit crimes and how repeatable it is for your deck to commit crimes, I mean, this could be the basis for a potential mill strategy. Now, I don't know how many of the other cards in this set can mill your opponents, but let's say you end up with a couple of Deep Mug Desperados. Let's say it's fairly trivial for you to commit crimes. I mean, I can see definitely... Um, going down the rabbit hole of trying to find a way to mill your opponents out. So this could be pretty interesting. And given the fact that it's a decent body, I'll give this card a C as well. Now, I don't know if you just play this in any deck, right? If you're just playing like, I don't know, a blue-red spells deck, is this something that you want? Blue-red multiple card, cast multiple spells? Maybe, I don't know. Because then you're, if you're only playing for this for the body, then it's kind of like a low C D tier type card, but if the mill is actually relevant and you think you can actually mill your opponent out, this card of course goes up in value. Next we have Jin of Fool's Fall. This is four and a blue for a four three flyer creature type Jin. Plot three and a blue. So very very basic simple creature here. You can either play it for five mana for four three as a flyer, which is okay. It's 
It's fine. It's nothing super impressive. We've had four mana, three, three flyers, and this one is worse than that. So, you know, that by itself is not great, but it does have plot, right? You can plot this on turn four and play it on turn five as a four, three. So paying four mana for a four, three flyer, despite the fact that it's delayed, does allow you to set up some double spell turns, which is an archetype if you're playing blue, and um, also allows you to not play a spell. So I think this is... A decent role player in those decks. I don't think it's spectacular by any means. I would I would just say this is kind of a filler level blue card, probably kind of a low C that you play in your blue decks. But I could be wrong about plot. It could play out better than I think. I just don't... I feel like when you plot this card, it is a pretty significant cost to not play something, a permanent on turn four, right? If you're on the draw and you're playing against an aggressive deck and you plot this on turn four, like you're just going to get run over, right? So... That's why I'm, you know, this is an expensive plot card. I don't know how good the expensive plot cards are going to be in this format. Moving on, we have Double Down, three and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever you cast an outlaw spell, copy that spell. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are all outlaws. Copies of permanent spells become tokens. So, what does that mean? Whenever you cast a creature that has one of those creature types listed, you get to make a secondary copy of that card. Here's the problem with this card, though. The only way this card actually ends up being good is if you get to copy two things, right? Because the first card you copy, you're kind of breaking even on, right? Because you get two copies of the next card that you cast. Let's say you play this, then you play another four mana warlock or something, right? But the turn that you played this, you are not adding to the board, right? So that's a downside. So the only way this actually ends up paying off for you is if you can play two or more. Now, obviously, if you can make the third copy, then this card is great. But the, given the fact that this is a bit slow and you have to have in your hand at least two copies of an outlaw, outlaw for, for me to be happy playing this card, makes me not that high on this card. So for me, I don't think I would take this highly. I think it's cool and it has high upside. But then I'm going to give this perhaps a controversial D just because I feel like you have to go through a lot of hoops to make this work. Um, I could see it eventually ending up in the C tier, but let's start with D here just because it doesn't, it doesn't add to the board in any way the turn that you cast it. All right, moving on. We have the world champion himself, Duelist of the Mind. One in a blue for a star three with flying and vigilance. All right. Duelist of the Mind's power is equal to the number of cards you drawn, you've drawn. you drawn this turn. So this is, the power always shifts. Whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. And by the way, how cool is that? Look at the flavor text. Nathan Stoyer, World Champion 28. That's awesome. That That's the dream. That's why a lot of these competitive players play. That is amazing. Big grats to Nathan Stoyer being the world champion, getting an amazing, amazing world champion card. Now, what does this card mean? On your turn, at the very minimum, this is a two mana, one, three flyer, right? Because on your turn, you're drawing a card for your turn. Now, it's not the best blocker because it is a two mana, oh, three flying vigilance creature. But I mean, just look at it. Even a two mana, one, three flying vigilance is fine. But if you ever commit a crime, this just loots for free. It does it once a turn, but if you can target your opponent in any way, you just get free loots. And when you do, all of a sudden you have a 2-3, right? And you can do this on your opponent's turn as well. And if if you can find a way to draw multiple cards in a turn, right? Then all of a sudden this card becomes even bigger. And for something that's so cheap as a two-mana threat, I just think there's just enough upside here where I'm going to give this a B. I don't think this is an A. It's not game warping in a, in a sense, but I think this is a very, very solid two mana creature that you should play in any deck if you have any way to commit a crime or draw cards, which I imagine, I mean, the set's called Outlaws of Thunder Junction. You better be able to commit crimes pretty easily. So I'm going to give Duelist of the Mind a B. Moving on, we have Emergent Haunting. I think this card is really sweet. One in a blue for an enchantment. At the beginning of your end step, if you haven't cast a spell from your hand this turn, Emergent Haunting isn't an if and Emergent Haunting isn't a creature, it becomes a 3-3 spirit creature with flying in addition to its other type. So, what it, and two blue surveil one. So, let's say you play this on turn two. On turn three, you say go. 
all of a sudden you have a 3-3 flyer. That seems great, especially if you have anything to do on your opponent's turn on turn three. And we've seen that there's a, there's a play, like, for example, I'm, it, maybe just because I like saying it, holy cow, right? Turn two emergent haunting, go. Turn three, land, go. You have a 3-3 three, three flyer and then you play holy cow. And all of a sudden you have a two mana 3-3 three, three flyer that you can also pay mana to surveil one. I mean, this seems borderline rare territory to me. So I think this card is great. And I'm going to give this an easy B that I think you'll just be happy playing in all of your blue decks. Next, we have Failed Fording. One in a blue. I don't know if any of you, I mean, this is giving me away my age. Any of you ever play like Oregon Trail? You play Oregon Trail and you try to cross the river or, or you try to ford the river and then depending on how fast you do it, you can like, it'll be total disaster and everybody on your team can just perish or whatever. This is just, it just reminded me of that for some reason. But um, one in the blue for an instant. Return target non-land permanent to its owner's hand. If you control a desert, surveil one. So, I mean, this is just a bounce spell. It's fine. Um, I don't think it's anything special. The fact that you need to control a desert to get a bonus and it's surveil one. Like, this is just a worse unauthorized exit by a decent amount, right? You just don't always get the surveil one. I'm just going to... But if you need a bounce spell, you need a bounce spell and you'll play it. I'm going to give this card a D. Like, I don't really want to play this card in my deck. Like, you'll play it if you really need a way to interact with your opponent. Maybe it can be a D plus, but not too happy with failed forwarding. Never taking this card early. Moving on, we have Fibblethip, Lost on the Range. Three mana. One blue blue for a 1-1 one, one legendary creature homunculus with ward 2. You may look at the top card of your library at any time. So we're going to have those gameplay. Any of you play with Centaur, uh, Course of Crucifix, just eh, 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 you're going to do that a lot. The top card of your library has plot. The plot cost is equal to its mana cost. You may plot non-land cards from the top of your library. So wow, this card can potentially give you a ton of volume, uh, value. This is like a reverse Course of Crucifix, actually. The only difference is this card is just a horrible blocker. It does have the ward too, so it has a little bit of extra protection, but it has like no board impact, right? It's You can kill this still, but treat it more like an enchantment, right? It's just like on the board and it gives you this threat, uh, this ability to generate a lot of card advantage, but it can generate you a lot of card advantage, right? Every time you hit a spell, you can plot it. So I feel like this is the type of card where in the late game, this can really um, do a lot of work. In the late game, I mean, you just, it, you know, kind of reminds me of like, uh, what is that card? Case of the Locked Hot House. It's kind of like that in a sense, right? It has no impact on the board early, but if you can resolve it late and you just start plotting, like you're just going to start running away with the game just because you're going to get a ton of value. I think it's a little bit worse in Case of the Locked Hot House. I'm going to give Fibblethip because of its body being so poor still and you having to plot everything. So like if you play against an aggro deck, this is pretty bad. I'll give this kind of a high C. I think it has a pretty high ceiling, um, obviously, but I think there are definitely instances where this card is just going to be too slow. But the card is very cool, I will say. Moving on, we have a Fleeting Reflection. Target creature you control gains Hexproof until end of turn. Untap that creature until end of turn. It becomes a copy of up to one target creature. So I think primarily you're using this to... As a, as a protection spell, right? It's a one in a blue protection spell. And as that, it's okay. Every now and then, you're going to be able to copy something big. And I guess there are instances where if your opponent has a 6-6 six, six in play and you have a 1-1 one, one and you attack, your 1-1 one, one can also randomly grow and become a 6-6, six, six, but it's highly situational. So for that reason, I'm just not super high on this card. I think this card, however, has potential upside to be awesome. Right? There are definitely going to be instances where this just blows people out. But then there are going to be instances where this is just a very mediocre combat trick. And I feel like that's what's going to be the case for this pretty often. So I'm going to give this card a D. But I'm definitely going to play with it just to see if it's better. Right? What if, what if I can give Hexproof to something to counter a removal spell and I can turn my token into something big and that's big? We'll see. But it doesn't look all that impressive to me. Next we have Geralf the Flesh Rite. Two and a blue for a 2-3 Mythic Rare Human Warlock Legendary Creature. Whenever you cast a spell during your turn other than your first spell that turn, 
Create a 2-2 blue and black zombie rogue token. Whenever a zombie enters a battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on it for each other zombie that entered that ba the battlefield under your control this turn. So what this means is the first time you... So when you play two spells in one turn, you get a 2-2 zombie. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is with plot, right? You plot a card, then on the next turn, you play the plot spell along with the spell for your turn. And if you do, then you get a 2-2 blue and black zombie. That's pretty good value, right? It's a three mana 2-3. Two, three, three. That's probably not that hard to get a 2-2 zombie. But the key here is if you can find a way to play three spells in one turn, that's where this card gets completely ridiculous, right? Let's say you plot a spell, then you play like two two drops or a two drop and a three drop, whatever, right? Then all of a sudden on that turn, you get a three three zombie and a two two zombie. That's incredible, right? That's a lot of value that you can potentially get out of Geralt. So I'm going to give this card still probably a B because you still have to plan around it. For example, um, actually, hold on. Let me, let me, let me think about this. So you can you can actually set this up where Jeralf doesn't Jeralf can be the second spell. You can so you plot a card, then you play Jeralf, then you play your plotted card, and you get a two two anyways. So it's like a it's like a three mana three mana four. Okay, you know what? I revise my. I was gonna give this card a B, but I think this card can actually be a low A, and there's just potential to go completely absurd with this card. I didn't think about the fact that you can actually plot something first and the turn that you play it, you can get a 2-2 out of the deal, right? I was thinking in my mind, you play this turn three and then you set up the plots later. But the fact that this can be the spell you play after the plot or before you play the plotted creature makes this a pretty easy three mana, two, three, get a 2-2 into play. And that alone is enough stats for me to put it into the A tier on top of the extra upside that you have for this card. I think Giralf is amazing. Slam it and be happy. Now we have Geyser Drake. Two and a blue for a 2-3 Flying Drake. It's a fine creature. I'm playing that in basically most of my decks. But as long as it's not your turn, spells you cast cost one less to cast. And we've already seen the 4-mana 4-4 four, four Flash creature. We're going to see a lot more other Flash creatures. We've seen some Flash cards in white as well. So I think this card is actually going to be really important, right? Three mana, two, three flyers, already a good body. But I think the fact that this cost reduction is going to be so important in this format because it's one of the main things that the blue-white deck, for example, is trying to do, that I think this you're going to get a lot of mileage out of the cost reduction uh, element out of this. If, this. if this thing just makes one spell cheaper, this card's great. If it makes two spells cheaper... We're getting kind of close to B territory almost. So for that reason, I think, it, especially in the context of this set, I think Geyser Drake is going to be a very high C. I think this is a card that you're going to take very highly. I got to look at the rest of blue here, but I think this is in the running for best blue common, which is a little bit weird when you just look at the body, but I think just the utility that it provides with the cost reduction is going to be really, really important. And you know me. I mean, I was team tipster all day. I love things that generate mana or make things cheaper. Moving on, we have Harrier Strix. One blue for a 1-1 flyer. It's a bird. When Harrier Strix enters the battlefield, tap target permanent. Two and a blue, draw a card, then discard a card. So I'm generally not the biggest fan of one, um, one drops in general, unless... It's like novice inspector, <laughs> or or it um, manipulates your deck in some way. This is just a one mana one one flyer. Now it does tap a permanent, but on turn one, this isn't that great. This is kind of like a card that you play later, and you it's a cheap way to kind of commit a crime, I suppose. And I guess it has a looting ability attached to it, but it's so expensive that it's not something that you're going to use that often. So I'm not super high on this, but I've been wrong on one drops before. But you know, like for example, like I didn't even take Rubble Belt Maverick that much that highly in the last set. And I think Rubble Belt Maverick is definitely better than this card. And I thought Maverick just had a home in certain decks. I ended up kind of coming up on it later. But I feel like Harrier Strix, it's it's gotta like prove its value to me. Like 
the ability to commit a crime for one mana has to be so good to the point where it makes me want to play this card. But for now, I think I'm going to give this card a D. Moving on, we have Jailbreak Scheme. Blue Sorcery. This is a Spree card. So this is the first Spree card I think we've seen in blue. If you pay blue plus three, so four mana, you put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, it cannot be blocked this turn. Not that strong, right? If you pay four mana to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature, not that strong. That's starting out pretty weak. But this is the better part, and this is why I think this card is great. Plus two. So if you play a blue and a two, target artifact or creature's owner puts the creature on the top or bottom of their library. Now they have they have the choice, but just the fact that when you just play this for three mana, you are card neutral. If you bounce their creature and put it on top, you're not down a card, right? They they have to draw that card for their turn. And if they put it on the bottom, great, you got rid of a creature. So the fact that the floor of this card is three mana, basically mana neutral bounce spell, that's already a solid card. Then the plus three becomes something that you just tack on for extra value that will randomly win you games in the late game. So like there's just going to be instances where you're like, oh, okay... I drew this card. Oh, I guess you're dead because I gave my 6-6 six, six green creature uh, uh, unblockable, right? So because of that, because the plus two ability is already solid and then you have this random ability to put a plus one, plus one counter, I think this card's great. I think this is a card that you're happy picking, happy having multiple copies of in your deck. This is definitely a high C. Moving on, we have an interesting card here, the key to the vault. One in the blue for a legendary artifact equipment. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, look at that many cards from the top of your library. You may exile a non-land card from among them. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. You may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Equip cost of two in a blue. So two to cast, three to equip, equip. If your creature connects, you get to look at that many cards and cast one of those spells for free. If you hit a land... If you hit all lands, then you can't play the lands. It's a lot of mana, right? It's five mana to equip, right? Play and equip. But if you can connect with this, oh man. If you can connect with this, I mean, that is incredible. If Especially if you can play a deck that has a lot of evasion. Like this is not good on just random ground creatures. You need unblockable creatures. You need flying creatures. For example, I can see this having a pretty good home in like a blue-white fly uh, skies deck. But I don't think this is a card that's good in every deck. And it's a lot of mana to kind of get to work. So where am I putting this? I think in a blue-white deck, this could be a C-level card if you have enough evasion. But in a lot of decks, I just think this is just too much mana for a card that doesn't give you any combat stats whatsoever. So I'm going to start a little bit low here on Key to the Vault. Just because in general, I am low on equipment in general. The equipment in Murders at Karlov Manor looked decent and they all ended up being bad. And this one doesn't even give you combat stats, and it costs more to play and equip. So I'm going to start with the D here on Key to the Vault. A little uh, disappointing, given that it's literally the Key to the Vault. Like, the whole storyline of Outlaws of Thunder Junction is Oko getting to the Vault. And the fact that this just isn't that great for Limited, I think, uh, makes me a little disappointed. But I could be wrong. We'll see. Next, we have Lone Shark. Three and a blue for a 3-4 Shark Rogue. When Lone Shark enters the battlefield, if you've cast two or more spells this turn, draw a card. It's got a plot cost of three and a blue. So, worst case scenario, you play this as a four mana 3-4 just on curve if you're falling behind, which is not good. That's not a great card. But where this card really shines is if you're not behind, if you're not behind and you can afford to plot this card, now you have some flexibility here because you can play a turn four, but if you're not behind, you plot this and then turn five, you play this and you draw a card. Yeah, I want that in my life. Or you plot something else, right? Let's say you plot something turn three and then you play that turn four and then you play the Lone Shark, right? Boom, you get to draw a card. Four mana, three, four body that draws you a card is very, very solid. But the thing is, it doesn't guarantee you that card draw. You do need to work for it a little bit. So I'm not going to have it super high up, but I do like this card. I'm going to give this card a C. It is curious to me, actually, over the course of the format, what ends up being the better four? Because blue has two fours that are decent. You have the Lone Shark and then the three blue four four that's Flash. 
I think a lot of it might depend on the deck that you're drafting, but given that there's kind of a glut there of two solid four mana blue options, I'm curious what ends up being better, or if you just don't have to prioritize them as highly because you have redundancy in the four mana slot. Next up, we have Marauding Sphinx. I like this one. I'm not going to lie. I'm just Let me read the card. Three blue blue for a three five flying vigilance ward two sphinx rogue. I'm in. I'm in. Three blue blue three five flying vigilance ward two. The really important part there is the ward two. But wait, there's a little bit more. Whenever you commit a crime, surveil two. This ability triggers only once each turn. It's not that hard to commit crimes. So the fact that you have, first of all, just the body, right? A 5-mana 3-5 Flying Vigilance War 2, I am in for all day, every day. Part of the reason why these cards have underperformed in the past, even like a 5-mana 4-4 Flyer in general, is because um, people can often trade up. Like, removal has gone a lot better recently in Limited Magic, and people can often trade up on mana by casting their murders or banishing light effects on the five drops. So the value of those five drops have gone down. I mean, look at Cranko's Buzz Crusher, right? It was a pretty mediocre card in the last set just because it was just a four mana, four, four flyer that you can kill. But because this has Ward 2 on it, your opponent has to at least spend most of the time at least as much mana, if not more, to get this off the battlefield, right? So you're not down on that exchange. But if they don't have the removal spell, now you're talking about a creature that can just take over the game, right? It's got a huge, it's got a lot of toughness. It's great at blocking. It still smacks them. And every time you commit a crime, you get to surveil too. So you just make sure you just draw action for the rest of the game, right? When you're surveilling, you're probably going to find more cards that can commit crimes. And you just kind of you just kind of keep that chain going. So I think Marauding Sphinx is really, really solid. For I know it's a five, right? You don't want too many fives, but for a five, there's not you can't get too much better than this for uncommon at five. So I'm gonna give this a B. Very, very solid B here for Marauding Sphinx. Next up, we have Metamorphic Blast. Blue Instant Spree Spell. Plus one until end of turn, target creature becomes a white rabbit with base power and toughness 01. So it's a two mana, make a creature into an 01. Plus three, target player draws two cards. So that's a lot of mana. So blue. if you play four mana, you get an inspiration. I guess you can target your opponent, but you don't want to do that unless you really need to commit a crime. But for three and a blue, you get to draw two cards, which is a really bad card. You don't really want to play that card ever. So what you have to look at this card for is the first part of the card, which is two mana, make a zero, make a creature into a zero one, which can act as a combat trick sometimes. And then every now and then in the really late game, for five mana, you can draw three, you can draw two cards and shrink something. I don't think this card is going to be particularly good. I've been generally pretty high on the spree cards, but the rate that you're getting on Metamorphic Blast is just not very strong. So I'm going to start this out at C. I could see it actually even going down from here, but I'm going to start this out with uh, as a C. Moving on, we have Nimble Brigand, two in a blue for a one three human rogue. Nimble Brigand can't be blocked if you've committed a crime this turn. When Nimble Brigand deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to take this card high, higher than I probably should. I think this card is awesome. I think committing a crime is going to be pretty trivial. I think there's going to be lots of ways to commit crimes. And as a result, this is effectively an unblockable creature in a lot of instances. And when you do, when you hit them, you draw a card. That's awesome, right? I mean, there are instances where you can just like play this on three. Yeah, and, and sometimes you can just hit them. If you can somehow find a way to give this evasion. Oh, wait, you can. You just cast the spell that targets your, their, their thing. So assuming that there is, assuming that committing crimes is trivial, I think this card is great. So I'm going to give this a B. Maybe it's like a B minus, but I do love the card. I've, I already liked Scroll 3 Thief which is basically just a three mana one three when it connects, you draw a card. But the fact that this actually can give itself evasion, it makes this card awesome. Next, we have Outlaw Stitcher. Three and a blue for a one four. When Outlaw Stitcher enters the battlefield, create a two two blue and black zombie rogue creature token. Then put two plus one plus one counters on that token for each spell you've cast this turn other than the first. So this card is awesome. So... Floor, absolute rock bottom floor. This is a four mana one four that makes a two four body. 
That's just a good card that you're going to be happy to play in any deck, right? You're getting three power and six toughness for four mana. Pretty solid. But where this shines is just the, the potential, where you can take this card, right? Because this card also has plot four and a blue. So let's say you plot this. On the next turn, let's say you play a creature and then you play this card or you play a spell and you play this card. All of a sudden you get a 1-4 with a 4-4 four, four zombie. If you can play an, uh, two spells, you get a 6-6 six, six attached to a 1-4 body. So I think this card is really, really sweet, especially because the floor is already pretty good. And the thing is, you don't even necessarily need to plot this. Let's say you just plot something else. Then you cast that as a plot spell. Then you play this. You still get the 4-4. Four, four. So Outlaw Stitcher is great. I'm going to give Outlaw Stitcher a B. Moving on, we have Peerless Rope Master. Four and a blue for a 4-4 four, four human rogue. When Peerless Rope Master enters the battlefield, return up to one target tap creature to its owner's hand. So that also allows you to commit a crime, which is relevant at times. So five mana, four, four, ETBs bounce a creature, but it has to be tapped. So that's the downside for this because it's conditional, right? It's conditional. There's going to be plenty of instances where let's say you're ahead and you have this as your five drop. What are you going to do? Just like play it and just not bounce anything. If you do, that's pretty underwhelming just on stats, right? So you kind of have to be in this weird back and forth board state where either you're behind and you bounce this or you're bo both you and your opponents are kind of like hitting each other and you need to do this. It works a little bit better against like the white decks that have saddle, right? But I think because of its um, conditional nature, there are instances where I think this card is going to be great, maybe even a high C level ceiling. But I think the floor is also pretty low. So I'm going to start this out as a D because it's a five drop that doesn't always quite do the thing that you want. ETBs, if they just don't have a tap creature, you kind of just have to play it if it's your only thing, right? Then you're playing five mana for a four four, which is kind of a low D level card. Next we have Phantom Interference. This is probably my favorite card. I don't know if it's the best card, but I love me some counter spells. And this card is incredible. Phantom Interference, it's a spree blue common. One blue, instant, spree, plus three. Create a 2-2 white spirit creature token with flying. So four mana for a 2-2 flash flyer is not good. That's not why you necessarily play this card. But, what, but get this, plus one. So for two mana, counter target spell unless its controller pays two mana. So we're looking at a card that is two mana counter target spell unless they pay two. That is just a playable card in a lot of decks, right? Reasonable Doubt ended up being a pretty solid blue common in Murders at Karlov Manor. But the downside of a card like this is it's pretty easy to play around, right? Because in the late game, you can just play where you're like, oh, they kept mana up. I can try to play around Phantom of Fears. But this plays around that too. Because in the late game, once you get to the point where the counter spell is irrelevant, you can still cash this in for a 2-2 flyer. So it's great in the early game, and it still gives you options in the late game. And don't even talk to me about playing this on turn five and countering something, like at least early in the format. Like you pass with five mana up, what is your opponent gonna do? They're like, oh my gosh, they can have phantom interference. If your spell gets countered and they get a two, two flyer out of the deal, that is ridiculous. And can you imagine this to go along with that geyser drake, right? Turn three, geyser drake, turn four, go. They play a spell, you can play Phantom Interference for four mana, right? You can play Phantom Interference for four mana. You get a 2-2 flyer and you counter their spell. How do you beat that? So Phantom Interference is awesome. I'm going to take it highly. I don't mind having two or three copies of this card in my deck for the most part. And I think it's probably going to be one of the top commons of the set. I think this card is fantastic. I'm giving this a high C. All right, next card. Plan the Heist, two blue blue sorcery. Surveil three if you have no cards in hand. So if you're hellbent, you get to surveil three, then draw three cards. It also has plot of three and a blue, which, you know, honestly, I can see you doing that pretty often. So this is a four mana sorcery that draws you three cards. Uh, every now and then you're going to be able to surveil three and draw three, which is great. So four mana for, for three cards is a pretty good deal, right? That's a pretty good deal. I think... Um, depending on the speed of the format, this can have a pretty wide range for how good it is. If the format's slow, this card goes up to like almost low B-level territory. 
if the format's just regular speed, I think this card's probably a C-level card. But I do like the card. I do like drawing cards. But I imagine people are going to take this card very highly. I would not treat this as a B-level card, but I know people will. So I feel like early on, it's going to make it into a lot more people's deck than my deck, even though I like drawing cards. I think the reason to plot this card often, though, is on turn four especially. Uh, you probably don't even want to cast this card on turn four. But if you do, you're not going to have mana to cast spells anyways, right? So you might as well plot this so that you can get some double double spell bonuses out of it on the following turn. But yeah, I mean, it's just your run-of-the-mill decent card draw spell. I'm going to give Plan the Heist a C. Next, we have the Razzle Dazzler. One in the blue for a 1-2 human wizard. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on Razzle Dazzler. It can't be blocked this turn. So how good is this card? Well, on turn two, you play this. That's a one-two. I don't think it's going to be that trivial to turn this into a two-three on turn three, right? I just I just don't see it. Like, unless you're playing a bunch of really, really cheap cards, right? Like, you need to have like a one-drop and a two-drop on turn three to be able to play this. And I just don't th see that being re like a realistic thing or something that happens that often. So I feel like what happens in in a lot of instances for this card is maybe turn four, if you can plot on turn three, maybe turn five, that's when you get to the point where you can get the plus one, plus one counter on it and it can't be blocked. But what does that mean then? Well, it means that when you play this on turn two, it doesn't have any impact in the game, combat stats wise, on turn two or on turn three, for the most part. It starts doing things on turn four, at which point it becomes a two, three. And then... And then you can maybe snowball this by having this be a win condition. But I don't know that I want too many of this card this card in my deck unless I have a lot of lot of cheap spells. So I don't I'm not that high on this card. I think this is a cool build around card. And if you can properly build around this card with a lot of cheap spells and a lot of plot cards, I can see getting it up to a C. But I think in a lot of decks, this card is going to be a D. Don't let all the fireworks uh, dazzle you. This card, I don't think, is as good as some people might think. I think some people look at this card and go, oh, it's a two-mana 2-3 two, that's unblockable. It's not the case. Like, you need to go through some hoops, and a card that doesn't have any combat stats for the first three turns of the game as an early drop, you can't even count this as an early drop, right? If you're on the draw and you play this and your opponent goes trained Erynx into three drop and attack you, and then attack you again turn four, and this thing's still in play, like, it just hasn't done anything for you, right? So that's kind of why I'm not super high on this card, just because it's the stats. If this was a 2-1, though, 2-1, solid C. But I'm going to start this out as a D and build around C if you can get it to work. Next, we have Seize the Secrets. Two and a blue. Draw two cards. This, costs, this spell costs one less to cast if you've committed a crime this turn. I mean, it's a divination. Divination isn't that great anymore. The fact that you can get the discount on it is nice. Like, if you can play this card for two mana, it's pretty good. But since you can't do it all the time, I'll give this, like, a low C. Like, you'll play it. I just, I'm not going to take this that highly. But if committing a crime is pretty trivial, and you can play this for two mana, then, like, I'll be more incentivized to play it. Maybe, like, cards like this is what makes you want to play, like, the Harrier Strix. Like turn three, you play the Harrier Strix and then you draw two cards, right? Something along those lines. So you like play a permanent that adds to their board, you commit a crime and then you play this. Something along those lines. Next, we have the Shackle Slinger. Two and a blue for a 3-2 creature, human soldier. Whenever you cast your second spell each turn, choose target creature and opponent controls. If it's tapped, put a stun counter on it. Otherwise, tap it. So this is really nice when you can cast it on something that's already tapped. Um, I don't really see a scenario where you like get to really go off with this card because it only triggers off the second spell each turn. It's a nice way to maybe try to push some damage through. The body isn't great, but you know, in the right deck, I can see this kind of doing some work and helping you push through some damage. And of course, another important thing is that this is a way to commit a crime. So all thing, all of that combined, I don't like the body though. All of that combined, I'll give this card a C. I think if you can take advantage of committing crimes and such too, um, you can do some work. But 
overall, it just doesn't look super powerful, but I can see it, um, you know, being good in certain matchups or being good in certain decks. Next, we have Shifting Grift. Blue, blue for a sorcery. It's a spree spell. Plus two, exchange control of two target creatures. Plus one, exchange control of two target artifacts. Plus one, exchange control of two target enchantments. So the thing we want to look at most here is the exchange control of two target creatures. How good is that effect? Well, it depends. If your blue deck has a lot of ways to generate, for example, the 1-1 one, one mercenary token, if you have a lot of ways to generate mercenary tokens, if you can swap, if you can pretty readily swap one of your mercenary, mercenary tokens for a decent creature that your opponent has, it can be okay. But the thing is, this requires you to have a creature and your opponent to have your creature and for your creature to be worse than their creature. And for this card to be really good, your bad creature has to be much worse than their good creature, right? So that's a lot um, that has to go right for this card to be good. So actually, I'm looking here. I have it at C. I think I'm going to change it to a D. I just feel like there are instances where this card is good. And I think this has the potential to be an awesome sideboard card, particularly if your opponents have good rares. But I just think there's a lot of instances where this just won't do what you necessarily want. Like, let's say you have a 2-2 and they have a 3-3, and then you swap it. Like, were you happy that you did that? Not really, right? What, what, what do you need to swap? You need to swap, like, your 2-2 for their 5-5. Then you're okay, I think, for the most part. And I don't know how often swapping artifacts and enchantments are going to be good here. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not too high on this card. I just, there are instances, like specifically, if you can make a lot of 1-1 tokens, then I think the value of this, you can bring this up to a C-level card if you can do that. But otherwise, I'm not going to take this highly. Next, we have Slickshot Lockpicker. Two and a blue for a 2-3 human rogue. When Slickshot Lockpicker enters the battlefield, Target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. So, this is basically Snapcaster Mage, all right? So you cast this for three mana. It doesn't have flash, though, so it's not as good as Snapcaster Mage, but if this is an uncommon. Let's be reasonable. But you play this, and if you have any extra mana, you can flashback any spell in your graveyard. That is a good card in the late game, particularly because this card... Yeah, I kind of slow rolled this one. Also has plot of two and a blue. And this is definitely the type of card that you want to plot. Not only can you, of course, use that to cast multiple spells in a turn or, or pass a turn without doing, you know, get a bonus or whatever. But the fact that now when you plot this card and you play it on the following turn, you have the mana to actually cast your card. So let's say turn two, you play like a galvanize on your opponent's creature, right? Turn three, you plot this card. Turn four, you play this for free. Flashback or Galvanize, boom, you got extra value, right? That's awesome. And then you can play another two mana card there if you want. So I think this card is um, is awesome. Something you should take very highly. Slickshot Lockpicker is a B for me. Next, we have another Slickshot. This is a Slickshot Vault Buster. This is two and a blue for a 1-4 Vigilance Human Rogue. Okay, it's a decent blocker. When Slickshot Vault Buster get, uh, sl excuse me, Slickshot Vault Buster gets plus two plus zero as long as you've committed a crime this turn. So, as long as it's fairly trivial for you to commit a crime, I mean, if this is a three mana one four vigilance that gets plus two plus zero every other turn, then we're looking at on average it's like a three mana two four vigilance. That can be okay, right? That can be okay. Um, now, keep in mind, um, this uh, card also just makes it really hard to block, right? Like, if you play this on turn three, and you attack them, and they just have, like, a 3-3 three, three on the battlefield, what are they going to do, right? Like, they can't really block. So, in a lot of instances, this can even act as, like, a, a pseudo-unblockable creature, right? You don't even have to commit your crime unless you actually have to. And then also on defense, if you're passing... With mana up and Slickshot Vault Busters in play, you just have to assume it's a 3-4. So that just makes this card like really annoying to play against. Now, it's still a 1-4. It's not like totally game-breaking stats. But just the fact that this threatens to be a 3-4 Vigilance in a lot of instances will warp how people play their game. So I'm going to give Slickshot Vault Buster a C. 
Next, we have the Spring Splasher. One in the blue for a 2-1 Frog Beast. Whenever a Spring Splasher attacks, target creature defending player controls gets minus 3, minus 0 until end of turn. So I will note that this is a way to commit a crime every turn, right? Or commit a crime until your opponent just like blocks and just dies. But it's a 2 mana 2-1. If you can somehow really go off, like let's say you go... <laughs> is this going off? Turn 2 Spring Splasher into turn 3 Slick Shot Vault Buster? You've, you've truly done it, right? But at the end of the day, this is still a 2 mana 2-1 creature with an effect that in general is not that great in blue decks. Blue decks, I mean, look at the other cards that we think are quite good in the blue decks. It's like the counter spell, things you want to play at instant speed. So this just doesn't quite have a great home in most blue decks. But of course, we'll see, right? For example, if this card was like a white creature somehow, it would be awesome, right? But as a blue creature, I think I'm going to give this card a D. Um, sure, it's a way to commit a crime, but just the body is pretty underwhelming. And there's a lot of ways to make 1-1 tokens in this format. So there's a lot of ways to just kind of block this if you need. Next, we have a rare. Step between worlds. Three and a blue-blue for a sorcery. Each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who draws, who does draw seven cards, exile step between worlds. Plot for blue-blue. So this is like a time twister effect. You pay five mana, both players or every player gets a basically time twister, shuffle everything in and draw seven. The problem with this card, of course, is the fact that your opponents, if you just hard cast this card, your opponent can take advantage of the seven cards that they draw first and you're not up cards for the most part. Also, when you plot and do this, you're still spending a bunch of mana for this effect while your opponent isn't. This is a card you do not want to play. I'm giving Step Between Worlds an F in Limited. Maybe it goes into cube though. Who knows? If you're an LSV Vintage Cube uh, enjoyer, maybe you can get him to add this to, uh, to his cube. Next, we have a better rare, I'm just going to say. Stoic Sphinx. Has there ever been a Sphinx that's bad? I don't think so. It's always, they always fly and they're gigantic. Two and a blue blue for a 5-3 Flash Flyer. Sign me up. Stoic Sphinx has Hexproof as long as you haven't cast a spell this turn. Wow. Not only can you ambush things with Stoic Sphinx, it's a 4-3 Flash Flyer. That's incredible stats, right? That's just awesome stats. Flash, you play at end of turn. It makes it not vulnerable to sorcery speed removal. But also on your turn, if you don't cast anything, it has Hexproof, so your opponent can't kill it, right? Your opponent can't kill it on your turn if you don't play anything. And then on their turn, they can't kill it either. Because it has Hexproof, because you passed and you haven't cast a spell yet. So this is a really, really difficult creature to uh, kill. You have to time it perfectly. You need to have like an instant speed way to kill this on, um, on your turn, if they cast it on your turn. And then also on their turn, you can only cast it after you take the five and presumably they play some creature afterwards. So great, great card. I'm going to give Stoic Sphinx an A. Very solid. Very solid creature that ends the game very, very quickly. Next, we have the classic blue removal spell. Stop cold. Three in a blue for a flash enchantment aura, enchant artifact or creature. When stop cold enters the battlefield, tap enchanted permanent. Enchanted permanent loses all abilities and doesn't untap during his controller's untap step. I'm kind of sad. I was hoping that they would add the um, dramatic accusation line of text. I thought that was really cool for for them to kind of buff up the blue removal spells just a little bit. I think this is just like a worse version of that card in a lot of instances. And I'm just not a, the biggest fan of this card. Like it's a removal spell that you play if you absolutely need some interaction. It's cool that it has flash because that works well with some of the cards where you want to pass. But I'm going to give this card a D. I think it's just like, you know, these types of removal effects just aren't great because if you, your opponents can can bounce their their own creature in some in some ways and there's just a lot of ways to negate this type of effect. So I'm just not super high on it. So I'm going to give this a D. If you absolutely need removal and you have a controlling deck, sure, you can play it, but I'm not taking this card very highly. Next up, Take the Fall. Blue. Instant. Target creature gets minus one, minus zero until end of turn. It gets minus four, minus zero until end of turn. Instead, if you control an outlaw, draw a card. So... 
I think in a random set, this card is fine, solid, C-level card. I think in this format, this is better than that. I think this is getting close to high C-level territory, and I, th I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked if this is the best blue common in the set because it turns on everything that you're trying to do in blue, right? You're trying to commit crimes. One mana, cantrip, check. You're, can you're trying to cast multiple spells in a turn. One mana, check. So in both things that blue's trying to do, cast multiple spells in a turn, this is a one mana cantrip. And the fact that you can use this as a one mana way to commit a crime, I think makes this card incredible. And I'm gonna, I'll play as many copies of Take the Fall as I can get, to be honest, right? Just because it's gonna just turn on a lot of other things that I have, right? If I have that three mana, one, four vigilance creature, this card's awesome, right? Shrink your thing, I have a three, four vigilance. It, it cycles. The fact that this card cycles, and every now and then, I mean, you're gonna have an outlaw in play and one mana, four, minus four, minus zero draw card is awesome. Like I said, I would not be shocked if this is the best common. I don't have it as my best common, but I wouldn't be shocked. It, it might be the best blue common. I think this card is going to be way better than it looks, and you should treat this card Wherever you have it now, I imagine it's going to be kind of mid-tier type card. I think it's better than that. I think this card is going to be really, really good, specifically within the context of Outlaws of Thunder Junction and what this set's trying to do. High C. All right, next card. This town ain't big enough. Four in a blue, four in instant. This target, this spell costs three less to cast if it targets a permanent you control. Return up to two target non-land permanents to its owner's hands. I really like this card. Four and a blue. Usually this effect is like three and two blue, so it's even easier to cast, potentially even splashable. But four and a blue for an instant speed way to bounce two things on your opponent's turn can just buy you a ton of tempo, right? If you just bounce like two four drops or what have you, right? They're just way, way behind. Even if you bounce their plot cards, whatever. But not only that, you have added flexibility here, right? Because let's say your opponent tries to kill one of your creatures, right? You can not, now the spell only costs two mana. You can still bounce their thing and bounce your thing, negate their, negate their removal spell and get a ton of value and still get that tempo back. So not only is this card good as a finisher, just the fact that you get added flexibility there in the cost reduction effect if you target your own things is also very, very nice. Usually I don't give bounce spells this high of a grade, but this town ain't big enough gets a B for me. Moving on, we have three steps ahead. This is going to be a highly, highly impactful constructed level card. Let's take a look at what it does. Blue for an instant. It's got spree. Plus one colorless and a blue counter target spell. So that's a cancel. One blue, blue counter target spell. Sure. Not great. Sure. Plus three colorless. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control. So for four mana at instant speed, you can clone anything that you have, any artifact or creature that you control. That's also a card that you can play in a lot of your decks, right? Cancel, check. Body, check. Plus two colorless. Draw two cards, then discard a card. This is probably the weakest effect, right? It's three mana, draw two, discard one. That's a card you're generally not happy with playing. But the fact that all of them are playable... And all of them you can fit in. And in the late game, you can if you can play this for six mana, for six mana, it's counter target spell and make a copy of your biggest creature. That's pretty good. For eight mana, I don't think you're going to get to eight. You get to even draw a little bit uh, uh, of action on top of that. For five mana, you can counter spell, draw two, discard one. All that flexibility, I think, makes this card much better than, obviously, the individual components. So because of that, not because I think counter target spell, not because I think cancel is a C or, or not because I think cancel is good enough or make a clone of a creature is good enough, but all those things combined and the potential blowout factor late in the game has me level up this card little by little. So I'm going to actually give this card a B because of all the extra added layers of flexibility. I think counter spell is going to be fine on three. Counter, um, creating a copy of your biggest creature to, to potentially ambush your opponent's attack, also great. There's just a lot of ways you can really get a lot of value out of this card. I don't think it's quite A-level, but I think this is a card that you're going to be happy playing in your blue decks. Next, we have Visage Bandit. Three and a blue for a 2-2. Two -two. 
You may have Visage Bandit enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature you control, except it's a shapeshifter rogue in addition to its type. It's got plot two and a blue. So it's kind of funny that this is right after this card. Three steps ahead for four mana, you get a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control. This is just this card, but you don't get all the other added benefits of it, right? You do get to plot it for three mana, which is a thing, but I think this card is significantly worse. I think this card is fine. There are instances where it can be okay, but I'm going to give Visage Bandit a C. And that's the difference between this card and the card that we saw previously. It doesn't have added flexibility, right? This only has the one mode of copying something that you control. It doesn't even copy the biggest creature. Like, you can't even clone your opponent's creature. It only copies your own thing. So you need to have something big before this actually becomes valuable. So I'm going to give Visage Bandit a C here. And now we have a Planeswalker. Jace Reawakened. Blue, blue, you can't cast a spell during your first, second, or third turns of the game. But it's a two drop. Why? Plus one, draw a card, then discard a card. Plus one, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. Minus six until end of turn. Whenever you cast a spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. So this is a Planeswalker that you can't play until turn four. And then when you do, you get to loot or you get to plot something. It doesn't give you immediate combat stats. It doesn't interact with your opponent's creatures in any way. It's just a looter. I think this card is actually not very good. I think this card is just not very good. I think, I mean, like, where do I even? Yeah, I mean, look, it's a planeswalker. You do get some card selection, but they can just attack it. Maybe you can set up some decent plot things, right? To set up some double spell turns. And the fact that it costs two mana when you play it on turn four, you can help it plot some other things. But I just think overall, the combination of abilities here is not all that exciting for a Planeswalker that you also just can't play on turn two. So I think I'm going to give Jace Reawakened a C. It could be even lower than that. But I'm going to give this a C just because it's a Planeswalker and Planeswalkers often just warp how games play out even if they don't seem that great because the game then revolves around trying to find a way to kill Jace Reawakened. But I just don't think its effects are all that strong. I am happy to be proven wrong, but it looks significantly weaker than most Planeswalkers that you see. But of course, it costs two mana. Next, we're getting into the big score cards. This is the first big score card. Let's see what Esoteric Duplicator does. It's a two and a blue for an artifact clue. So whenever something's a clue, you know you have the ability to pay to sack, draw a card. Whenever you sacrifice Esoteric Duplicator or another artifact, you may pay two colorless. If you do, at the, be at the beginning of the next end step, create a token that's a copy of that artifact. Two mana, sacrifice Esoteric Duplicator, draw a card. So let's assume you don't have anything else to sacrifice. There's just not a ton of artifacts in this format to sacrifice. So I'm just going to assume that that's just not why you're playing this card. What this card essentially is, it is a three mana artifact. Once it's in play, when you, two pa when you pay two mana to sacrifice it, you can pay an additional two mana to, draw, uh, to put it back onto the battlefield. That seems really bad. So what this means is for every four mana that you pay, you draw a card, right? Because you pay two mana to sacrifice this, then this ability triggers, and then you pay another two mana, and then it comes back into play as a copy. And then when you when you sack it, repeat. So for every four mana, you draw a card and it also costs three to cast. That is far too slow for modern limited magic. So I just don't think this card is especially good. I'm going to give this card, let's say a generous D. I'm going to give this a generous D. You know, no, this is, just, this is just an F. It's just way too much mana. Maybe in sealed deck, you can try to play it in if you're really controlling, but... Paying four mana to draw a card is just not something that I'm interested in. So I don't really want to play this card in my deck. So starting things out pretty bad here. Maybe it gets better. Simulacrum Synthesizer. Two and a blue for an artifact. When it enters a battlefield, scry two. All right. A little bit of value ETB. Whenever another artifact with mana value three or greater enters the battlefield under your control, create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token with... This creature gets plus one, plus one for each artifact you control. So a lot of these cards seem like nice constructed build-arounds. 
I will, I'm not going to lie to you though. I don't actually know the density of artifacts in this set, but I haven't seen a whole lot that indicates that there's going to be a lot of artifacts in the limited environment. Yeah, I mean, even if you look at the last set, right? Like this would have been pretty cool in blue red, right? Like anytime or anytime you, if you have a deck that generates a lot of clues, you get to start making gigantic construct tokens. But as is, this doesn't give you a construct immediately. You need to put an artifact into play. And I feel like you need to put two artifacts into play before you're getting decent value out of this. So for that reason, I think this is also probably an F, unless there's a lot of ways to get artifacts into play, which I don't think there is for this format. If you somehow get a bunch of artifacts in your deck, maybe you can get this up to a C-level card, but don't take this high. All right, double F. Maybe, maybe this one will be okay. World Walker Helm. Two and a blue. Man, all of these trigger over, over artifacts. If you would create one or more artifact tokens, instead create those tokens plus an additional map token. One in a blue. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control. I don't know why there's so many things with these tokens. They all kind of work together, I guess. But again, I just don't know that I've seen enough artifacts here to make this pan out. You have to pay three mana. If you just look at the first ability as it's static, anytime you play an artifact, you get an extra map. That's okay. How many maps do you need to make before this card's worth it? Like three, four, something along those lines. You, the, the way you really get value out of this is by using that two mana ability to hopefully copy like an artifact token creature. I guess if you get World Walker Helm plus Simulacrum Synthesizer in the same deck, it can pan out. But you know what? I'm just going to give it another F. That's three for three on Mythic Blue Rares in Big Score. That's very disappointing. At least in the white one, there was like an awesome one. But this one just has like all blank. So that's really disappointing. But maybe the bonus sheet cards will save us. Moving on, we have Archive Trap. Three blue blue instant trap. Target opponent mills 13 cards. If an opponent searched their library this turn, you may pay zero rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Now, I don't know how much um, deck searching exists in this format, but I imagine it's not that many. So I imagine this is mostly just kind of a five mana mill 13 cards. Uh, I think this card's bad. It's probably a D. Now, we'll note, we'll note, there is a, a, an instance where this card can be good. And that is... Um, the two in a blue, two, four uncommon. Whenever you commit a crime, you mill them for three. So let's say because people aren't going to take those cards that highly, let's say you get a couple of cop copies of that card and then you get Archive Trap. Like then you have a nice baseline for a decent mill deck, right? Because not only that, if you have that two, four in play and you cast the Archive Trap, you're targeting them. You get to mill them for 16 cards and it doesn't take too long before you can actually mill them out. So I think in a specifically the mill deck with the two four like you're relying on getting those uncommons, then I can see you taking the archive trap highly, but first pick first pack you're never going to want to take this highly. I'm going to give this card a D, but in the mill deck maybe it's a C, right? Like you don't even have, you're going to you're going to get this like on the wheel. Like you're going to you're not going to have to take it highly. Next one. Archmage's Charm. Blue, blue, blue. Choose one. Counter target spell. Target player draws two cards. Gain control of target non-land permanent with mana value one or less. This is an excellent card in Constructed, but I think in Limited, it is simply far too hard to cast, and you only get one ability out of this, right? The, you have to really stretch your mana to cast this card, and you're just not getting enough value, in my opinion, for, to make this card worth it. Three blue to counter a spell. Meh. Three blue to draw two cards. Eh. Three blue to steal something that costs one or less? No, thank you. I think this card's too bad to cast. I know it's flashy. It's got a lot of words. It's a charm. It's cool. This is a D. I'm not going to take this card very highly for my decks. If you're mono blue, I guess you can take it. But if you're not mono blue, just pass it. Unless you want to keep it because the art's really cool. I can't, I can't fault you for taking uh, stuff where the art's cool. All right, moving on. Commandeer, five and two blue for an instant. You may exile two blue cards from your hand rather than pay the spell's mana cost. It's a free spell, although you three for one yourself. Gain control of target non-creature spell. You may choose new targets for it. So you get to basically copy any spell and then 
kind of like redirect it, if you will. So if like your opponent uses a removal spell on one of your things, you can exile two cards and cast this and then choose new targets for this. The problem with this card is you can't just steal their creature. If you could like steal their creature spell and then cast it, that would be at least okay. But given that this only works on non-creature spells and it's such a high cost, I'm just going to give this an F. Just don't play this card in your deck either. My spreadsheet has it as a D. I'm, I'm adjusting it to F. I just It's cost seven or it costs you three cards. Sure, there are instances where like you, you like redirect a removal spell, but like you're still down a card if you did that. So I just don't think this card is something that you want to put in your deck. Man, these blue cards stink. Have I looked at it? All these special blue cards have all been terrible. There better be at least one good one. Okay. The best one so far. It's an uncommon. Essence Capture. Two blue, instant. Counter target creature spell. Put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. Now, I will preface this by saying you do need to be pretty heavy blue. I'd like to play like 10 islands if possible to play Essence Capture in my deck. But if you do, you get to counter a creature. And the fact that the, the really desirable part about this card is the fact that you also get to pump one of your creatures. So Essence Capture, it's a little bit hard to cast, but I'm happy enough ca playing this in my blue heavy decks. I'll give Essence Capture the highest grade so far among all these special cards, a C. Wait, do I have to do it this way? A C, there we go. Moving on. Okay, okay. We have... We have moved up some ranks now. All right. Mana Drain. I cannot believe they printed Mana Drain. This is absurd. What's next? Black Lotus? Blue, blue. Instant. Counter target spell. At the beginning of your next main phase, add an amount of colorless mana equal to that spell's mana value. This card can lead to so many blowouts. I mean, if you play Vintage Cube, you know what I'm talking about. You counter something... Then it's your turn. You counter a five drop. It's your turn. You now have five mana to just unload your hand. This card can be completely awesome. I, I am not going to pass this card just because it's so cool. But it's it probably plays worse than you might think. Like there are instances where you play this and maybe you can't use the mana. But like thing is, if you ever have this early, like if you just... Think about it this way, like in a regular, like, like let's say you're on, let's say you're on the draw, right? Turn three, you just say go, right? And then they play their three drop. You mana drain their three drop and then turn four, you have seven mana. You can play a seven drop. I mean, you're probably not going to have a seven drop in your deck, but you know what I mean? You can just like double spell. This can lead to so many blowouts. So this is one of the best counters it's probably somewhere between a high B and a low A, but because of nostalgia alone, I'm going to give this an A. It's a low A, but it just the, there's going to be so many blowouts with this card. The, the floor is just like it's a counter spell. It's always going to be fine. But the ceiling, just the fact that you can just potentially use this to trigger your double spell effects, right? Because you got all that extra mana too on top of that is awesome. Awesome. Is, is really awesome. So uh, pretty cool that they printed Mana Drain. Next, Mind Break Trap. Why? Oh, this is not a mill spell. Two and two blue. If an opponent casts a three instant, it's a trap. If an opponent casts three or more spells this turn, which is almost never going to happen, you may pay zero rather than pay the spell's mana cost. Exile any number of target spells. So what this effectively is, it's a four mana counter spell that you can exile. It's not good. Don't take this highly. I'll give it a D. I'm probably being generous there. Not great. Don't take it. Lots of bad blue rares. At least there's Mana Drain. And last, but not least. Now this is another bounce spell I can get behind. Repulse. Two and a blue. Instant. One of my favorite, favorite cards out of Invasion Block Limited. Two and a blue for an instant. Very simple. Return target creature to its owner's hand. Draw a card. It, it's the nostalgia. It's the nostalgia, man. I love this card. This card's great. I'm gonna take it highly, and I'm gonna like it. Repulse to me is a blue uh, is is a blue card, but it is also a B for me. It replaces itself. It can get you some tempo. Um, 
you can save your own creatures. The fact, I mean, just the fact that when you add the cantrip, the draw card to this, it just becomes so much better. Uh, so, so much better. The, we, we've already seen how good this card can be. You know, if they have a token, killing a token, drawing a card. Uh, so many effects like this typically have like surveil one or two added to it. This one just straight up draws you a card, replaces itself. Very, very happy to have Repulse in my deck. And um, I'm just smiling thinking about Repulse. And because that's kind of when I started drafting competitively was when Invasion came out on Magic Online, along with Odyssey Block. Those were kind of the two blocks. And yeah, I just have a lot of fond memories of Repulse. There was even a constructed deck where I would Repulse my Flame Tongue Kavu. I think it was called Flame... I don't, I don't remember what it was called, but it was like Repulse, Mystic Snake, Flame Tongue Kavu. Yeah, if, if, you're, if you made it this far, let me know what the name of that deck was. Snake Tongue? It might have been called Snake Tongue. Anyways, Repulse is a great card. You should take it pretty highly. So where, did that, where does that leave us? Blue seems pretty cool. Blue seems pretty cool, and I, it does seem like a very, very good uh, controlling color, right? And I really am looking forward to the play style that blue brings to the table here because a lot of it, what it wants to do is set up. It wants to play a bunch of spells. It wants to play multiple spells in a turn or just say go. And the control player in me is really happy about that because when you say go, you can have uh, uh, an amazing counter spell, right? In um, Phantom Interference. And you can also just play a 4-4 flash creature uh, when you pass. So I just feel like I'm really going to enjoy playing blue. I think blue also seems fairly deep. And uh, I'm really excited to get to play with it. I think I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to playing blue. So top five commons here for blue for me. We have Geyser Drake. Geyser Drake. And I don't know if this is going to end up being the best blue common, but I just feel like this is everything that you want in the blue in the blue decks because a lot of the cards that I like also are instants but Geyser Drake is a two two and a blue for a two three flyer and um I know I'm going in the reverse order as the last video but whatever two and a blue for a two three flyer and there's just a lot of ways the, the more I'm seeing all the other cards the more I'm liking this card there's just a lot of great instant speed things that you can play and getting the cost reduction is great on top of the two three body number two is take the fall which is the one blue instant target creature gets minus one, minus zero, draw a card. If you have an outlaw, it's minus four, minus zero, draw a card. I think this is everything you want in any of your blue decks. It's a super cheap way to commit your crimes. It's a cantrip and it also allows you to double spell. I would not be shocked if this becomes the highest win rate card in the, um, for blue. I would not be shocked. In fact, I'm very close to just swapping one and two. It's possible because I feel like you can just never have too many take the falls. You just want take the falls to basically turn on everything else that you want to do. Number three is Phantom Interference. And that's the counter spell. So one in the blue counter target spell if your opponent can't pay two. And then for three mana, it's a spree spell. For three mana, you make a two, two flyer. I think this card is going to be amazing. And if you're playing against a blue deck and your they have four or five mana up, you just shake your head and try your best to play around this card. This card is going to lead to a lot of blowouts. It's going to be good early and also late. Take it very highly. Number four, Jailbreak Scheme. That's the bounce spell. That's two and a blue. Put target creature on the bottom or top of uh, your opponents can choose, but they can put a creature on the top or bottom of their library. And then for plus three, you can put a plus one, plus one counter and make target creature unblockable. I just think this is just a really solid interactive spell that you're going to be happy playing. And in the late game, oops, I win. It just has that randomly attached to the card, which I think takes it to another level. And then number five, I think this is kind of close. All these cards kind of feel kind of samey to me, but I'm going to give it to Lone Shark because I'm a hoper. I'm a believer in this plot stuff. I think this plot stuff's going to work. I think playing multiple spells in a turn is going to be able to work. And if that is the case, then we're talking about a four mana three, four that enters the battlefield and draws you a card. That's just a really fabulous rate for a creature. So I'm happy to have that in my deck. This card can go up or down depending on how easy it's going to be to cast multiple spells in one turn. So there you have it, folks. The top five blue commons and the blue set review here for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. If you've enjoyed this content and wanted to support this channel in another way, I did launch my Patreon channel. The link to the description, the link rather, 
is in the description below. Shout out to all the current patrons. I really do appreciate all of your support. The Discord is going to be super valuable. A lot of people there are going back and forth on card evaluations, and I try my best every morning, every evening. I'm super active. It's the best way, honestly, to be able to interact with me if you wanted to just ask me questions. I try to answer everything that people talk about there for now as it's growing, but um, yeah. That's the place where you need to be. So again, check out the link in the description below. Outside of that, thank you so much for watching. This was Outlaws of Thunder Junction, the blue limited set review. We have plenty more to come. Tomorrow, we're going to be reviewing the black cards. We're going to be reviewing the black cards. So I will see you tomorrow with the black cards.